Welcome back to our study of Galatians. Uh, we're making progress as we follow Paul's argument. And I want to pause and say something right now that I anticipate coming back to uh, multiple times. And that is that Galatians, well, Galatians is a funny book for a number of reasons. One of them is I deeply believe that Galatians is one of the most encouraging uh, reassurances that we have in all of Scripture that is designed to warm our heart. It is designed to convince us not just at a knowledge level, but at an affect level, at a desire level, at a deep level, that we belong to Jesus not because of our religious performance, not because of our moral track record, not because of how much we know about God, but because God has invited us into his family by sending his son to die for us, offering us forgiveness, and welcoming us into his group. But Galatians, even though I think it is aimed at the heart, goes directly through the mind, and it is one of the most rigorous and challenging logical arguments we find in any book of the Bible. And so what we're going to continue to do is to trace the argument that Paul is providing and to try to keep one eye on the fact that ultimately he's aimed at transforming us at a deep level. So with that in mind, let's remember where we've been. Uh, we know what Galatians is, is a defense of gospel freedom. We know the context in which Paul writes it to a church full of Gentile Christians who are tempted to submit themselves to the law of Moses and to follow all of these commands as a way of, uh, you know, further establishing, maintaining, and growing in their uh, relationship with the God of Israel, the God who revealed himself in Jesus. And we know that Paul is giving us various arguments to defend against this other gospel and for his own. We've seen that the first part of his argument in chapters 1 and 2 may be adequately characterized as a biographical defense of the gospel because Paul is telling the story of his own reception of the gospel, and in doing so, he actually is telling the story of how the gospel got a hold of him. We've looked at two-thirds of the argument. We saw that um, in chapter 1, Paul argues that the gospel is received by revelation. That most fundamentally is why we should believe it. Uh, then, even though it was received by revelation and needs the approval of no man or men or council or group or, or code, it is nevertheless supported by Jerusalem that the other leaders of the early church understood what Paul was doing and they said, let's go for it. We're going to different places and so our ministries aren't going to look exactly the same, but we're preaching the same gospel of the same Jesus. Such an important thing to be able to do. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the third and final part of Paul's biographical defense where we see that the gospel is sustained in conflict. It's one thing for things to go well when everybody sees eye to eye. It's another thing to see what happens whenever people come into conflict with one another. And in this particular case, it's a conflict from two people who are fairly important to the establishing of the apostolic gospel, the true message that we believe. Let's read the text. Uh, we're looking at Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Uh, we're going to exposit this text in this section. And then one of the things that this section will do is to draw our attention to the language of justification. And after we make our way through the first two-thirds of Paul's argument, we're going to pause for a moment, and then we're going to actually see what it means to take some of these things personally. So for now, we'll exposit what Paul says. Picking it up in verse 11 says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Now, just to be clear, Cephas is another word for Peter. Uh, they had multiple languages in the ancient world, primarily Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And so Cephas is, is just another way of referring to the same person, Peter. We don't exactly know why Paul does this. Uh, some people think he's sort of digging at him. I don't think he's digging at him. Maybe he's showing that they're friends. Who knows? But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you compel Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean Christ promotes sin? 
<laughs> Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Let's break this down into um, two parts. First of all, you have uh, Peter's action. I want to talk about what Peter did. Uh, you could probably fill in the blanks by reading it closely, but let's make sure we're on the same page. So um, they're in Antioch, which is a city in the ancient world. And uh, there are a number of Christians who were eating together. And Peter is eating with the Gentile believers. Uh, no big deal at the time. And so he's eating alongside them. Um, and it's fairly important in the ancient world, actually, to say it's no big deal is to underestimate the importance of table fellowship, of meals. Uh, even now, meals tell you a lot about people. And uh, even in our world where the rules aren't quite as distinct, you're not going to sit down for a meal with just anyone. All, all the more so in the ancient world. To, to sit at a table with someone meant a little bit more socially. It meant something about your affirmation of them as people in some form or fashion. And so he would eat with the Gentiles and they would enjoy fellowship together. And then some men came from James, from Jerusalem, uh, Jewish men who were very committed to following the law. And as soon as these men came from James, Peter actually fell back and he stopped eating with the Gentiles. And instead, he would only eat with the Jews. And this had an impact on others. Even Barnabas and others would stop eating with the Gentiles and only eat with the Jews. Now, if this seems silly to you, it's because it probably reminds us of the junior high cafeteria. I mean, it really is. It takes me back to those places, you know, where you walk in. I don't know if you remember whatever grade you were in when you first stepped into a cafeteria in junior high, but you walk in and you're like, who am I going to sit with? And there almost is this sense of that, except I want to stress, it's not as silly or in any way immature. It is sort of that writ large because it matters. Who you eat with, again, is at some level communicating who you regard as part of your group. So that was what Peter did and how it impacted others. He was eating with Gentiles. Then some Jews who were passionate about the law showed up and he stopped eating with Gentiles and he would only eat with the Jews and others followed suit. Now what I want to look at is Paul's response. And to call it a response wouldn't be quite specific enough. Uh, let's call it what it was, Paul's rebuke. I want you to notice Paul's interpretation of Peter's behavior. He uses a number of strong words to describe what Peter does. He first of all says that Peter's acting out of fear. He's worried about what they're going to think of him. He also says that Peter is being a hypocrite. He's now acting in a way that is inconsistent than he acted before. And he says that Peter's actions force or compel uh, these Gentiles to live by Jewish customs. So what Peter does is merely change his tables. But how Paul interprets this is that Peter is putting pressure on these Gentile Christians because he recognizes that they're going to notice Peter's no longer eating with us. And that is going to communicate to them that they are second-class Christians. That at some level, here's the real people whom God is pleased with. And if you want to be one of them, well, dot, 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 think about it. And Paul says, I'm not going to have any of it. He says, you're acting out of fear. He says, you're being a hypocrite. And this is the most important one. He says, you are not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Paul who does present himself as the hero of the story at some level, says, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I spoke up in front of everyone. And he rebuked Peter in no uncertain terms. And since for Paul, there's never a bad time to preach the gospel, he uses this as an opportunity to lay out the gospel by way of reminder to Peter, to the men from James, and to the Gentiles who aren't quite sure things are okay. And then he retells it in this particular letter so that the Galatians can also hear it. And we might as well add ourselves to the list as well. So let's look at the key idea that Paul is communicating. And then let's see if we can't break it down um, by following his logic. The key notion here in Paul's rebuke is the, uh, the idea of justification. Uh, it is a central idea for Paul, uh, particularly in the letter to the Galatians and in the letter to the Romans. And as I said, it's a, it's a word that I want to make sure and introduce into our vocabulary right now, understand it in connection with this, uh, this event and Paul's sermon, and then we'll circle around a little bit later and see how we can allow this word to be more than just a word, but actually something that serves for us as a window into God's heart uh, for us. So justification is a term that um, in its most simple sense means to be declared righteous. 
It is a term that not always, but usually, uh, refers to the law court. So a situation in which a person is being accused of something. For them to be justified means that they are declared righteous. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're innocent, but it means that they are declared innocent. They are declared not guilty. They will be treated by the court as someone who is not guilty. They will be treated by the community as someone who is not guilty. So it's not exactly the same thing as forgiveness, although the two are related. Forgiveness is the good news that our sins won't be held against us. Justification is the declaration that the court, the judge, has found in our favor. And that means we'll be, we will be regarded and treated as an innocent person by the judge as well as by the community. So there's a vertical component to this and there's a horizontal component to this. To be justified before God means that God accepts us as a person who belongs to him. We are welcome in his home. And there also is a horizontal element. How do we know, I know that I'm welcome in this home. How do I know that you're welcome in this home? How do I know that you're allowed at this party? And justification actually answers that question as well. To be justified by God means that you are to be regarded as justified by the brothers and sisters. And what Paul does in this particular section, he's pretty laser focused on the basis for our justification. He says it is not by works of the law, but it is instead by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, both of these terms are hugely studied and widely disputed. I think works of the law is most simply taken as an understanding of doing what the law of Moses requires, doing what the law of Moses calls us to do, living as persons who are under the old covenant that God made with Moses. That, I think, is in the simplest sense what works of the law means. And Paul says you are actually not going to be justified by God by following the Old Testament laws. You are going to be justified before God by, and then he uses this phrase, the faith of Christ Jesus. Some people think that this is referring to the faithfulness of Christ Jesus, that his faithful death is what provides our justification. Others take a more traditional reading that it is our faith in Christ Jesus. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I go back and forth in finding arguments on both sides convincing. And it's not that it doesn't matter, but I want to suggest to you that what we can all agree on is that we're talking about our entrusting ourselves to the Jesus who died for us. He died faithfully on our behalf, fulfilling God's covenant promise to Israel, and we put our faith in him, accepting this gift of righteousness that he offers that we do not deserve. So what Paul is saying here is that we're justified by God, not by eating at the right table, not by being circumcised, not by following the law of Moses, but by receiving the gift that God has given us by sending his son Jesus to die for us and to demonstrate his love for us in this way. So that's what Paul is saying here about justification. And again, we'll return to this as we proceed. I don't want to leave you hanging with some of the other statements that are made. So let's just walk this through statement by statement. He says, I'll pick it up in, in uh, verse 15, we who were Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles. He doesn't mean that Jews aren't sinful, but the word sinner in their world tended to mean Gentiles or Jews who live like Gentiles. And so I think Paul's using this term in a way that we would put scare quotes around it. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we we're just saying. So we too, as Jews, have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Sometimes Paul has to repeat himself to make the point. Then he says at verse 17, but if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? If you want to understand that statement, you need to remember the context. So he's essentially talking still about Peter going and eating with the Gentiles. And he's saying, if in seeking to be the people Jesus wants us to be, we Jews find ourselves eating with the Gentiles, sitting among sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? That is essentially what Paul is saying. These, these men from James and Peter and Barnabas are communicating with their actions. They're communicating that it's actually wrong for you to sit with the Gentiles. And he's saying, what does he respond with? He says, absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. So basically, think of it like this if you have the Jewish side of the cafeteria and the Gentile side of the cafeteria. In the Old Testament, God called his people to maintain a distinction, to separate themselves in critical ways from the Gentiles around them, from the nations around them. And so there's a line between the two. The Jews, figuratively speaking, stay over here. Sometimes literally the Gentiles are over here. He's saying that what uh, the apostles have discerned from what God has done through Jesus is that this line has been removed. And that's why Peter finds it okay to eat with the Gentiles. But now he's saying, Peter's hopped back over here 
which seems to communicate that being over here was bad. Does that mean that Jesus actually promotes sin by sending people over here? Paul basically says, no, like we erased the line. And if we're going to act like it matters which side of the table you're on, then we're already in trouble because we were on that side of the line. I hope I'm I hope you're following what I'm saying as Paul's communicating this because it's a little bit back and forth, but if you think about the original context, I think it can be sufficiently clear. What he's saying is your actions are still playing by the old rules. We all agreed that the rules rules are no longer in play. And so if you're going to act like they're in play, bring them back in play and you'll find that we're all in trouble. He's trying to reduce their argument to absurdity. Then he gives one of the most fascinating and deep statements I think we find in all of Scripture. For through the law, uh, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Paul actually believes that the, the way to be most faithful to the law of Moses is to actually no longer regard the law of Moses as being the means of receiving justification. The law itself actually points us forward to the time when we would lean into Jesus and let go of the law. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. There is an old life that I have completely done away with, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live by the body, I live not by works of the law, but by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is one of the most personal statements in all of Paul's writings. He usually talks about Christ's love for us, Christ giving himself for us, but here he takes it personally. Christ's love for me, Christ giving himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Let's go ahead and move toward takeaways because we're going to continue meditating on these same truths as we proceed. One of the things I want to acknowledge with you is that um, legalism is for us a real temptation. To find um, a concrete list of rules that we can use to measure our spirituality and each other's is actually a real temptation whether it's the law of Moses or some other list that is alien to the teachings of Scripture. And I think part of the reason why this is the case is because if you're going to be, I'm going to use the term in general sense, a religious person, we religious people, we people, and all I mean is who try to take God seriously, we sometimes actually think that legalism is a better form of godliness. We sometimes fall into the sort of rule follower syndrome that thinks, I mean, grace is great, But actually, following a list of rules is the best way to go. And yet here Paul says, no, legalism, leaning on your list of rules in order to establish your place before God, is not a higher form of godliness. It is a manifestation of the old self that died with Jesus. We've mentioned that Paul was pretty sharp in this letter. Can I compare this to 1 Corinthians? I don't know how well you know 1 Corinthians, but the church in Corinth was a mess. They had people sleeping with extended family members. They were getting drunk at communion. They had tension between the rich and poor. They had a bunch of celebrity preachers and they were arguing about who was better and who was closer to whom. I mean, all kinds of chaos, all kinds of foolishness, all kinds of sin. And yet Paul is harsher in Galatians than he was in Corinth. And it's not because he knows the Galatians better. He planted both churches. It's because Paul recognizes that legalism is a poison that seeps into our religious bloodstream. And we think it's drawing us closer to the Lord, but actually it's pulling us further away. The other thing I think we need to see in this is that this whole thing is about Peter switching sides of the cafeteria, which I would imagine to him didn't seem like that big of a deal. I would imagine if you ask Peter, when you moved across and only ate with the Jews, are you telling the Gentiles that they have to be circumcised in order to be saved? I think Peter would probably say, of course not. That's not what I'm communicating. And yet Paul seems to suggest otherwise which is a humbling lesson for us because it tells us that sometimes our actions send messages that are antithetical to the truth of the gospel. Look at what Paul says. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, sometimes our actions send unintentional messages that are antithetical to the truth of the gospel. And this is not something that we are free to ignore. This is something that we need to pay attention to, to be aware of, and to avoid. And finally, Last takeaway, no matter how you swing these things, one of the things I think we must see is that we never get to a point where we no longer need to hear the gospel. We never graduate from grace. Paul is preaching the gospel to people who know the gospel because one of the best things you can do for people who know the gospel is preach the gospel. And one of the best things that you can do for yourself 
is preach the gospel. I don't even care if you preach the thing to a mirror. Preach the gospel again and again and again because we never get to a point where we don't need it. We never matriculate beyond it. There's no place in the curriculum that is, now that you've got the gospel, here are some other things. No, you go further into the gospel. We remember the gospel. We remember the good news that Jesus is the Messiah who died for our sins, rose again, and provides the only justification that we could possibly receive. And so, in studying this passage where we see that the gospel is sustained in conflict, let's once again remember that in Christ, we, you and I, are saved, justified by grace through faith. So rejoice in this, be at peace in this, and be free.